Hello there, very good evening and welcome to the news tonight here on Rajya Sabha TV. I'm Tracy Shilshi, bringing you the day's top stories from India and across the world, starting with the headlines. In his maiden policy announcement, RBI Governor Urujit Patel endorses a rate cut of 0.25%. Sensex rises by 91 points to close at over 28,334. India and Singapore hold comprehensive talks on trade and investment. Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his counterpart Lee Hsien Luong agreed to strengthen cooperation in countering terrorism. A day after Karnataka releases Kaveri River water for irrigation to help farmers save their standing crop, Supreme Court directs Karnataka to release 2,000 cusics of water per day to Tamil Nadu. And after the BCCI threatens to call off the ongoing series between India and New Zealand, Justice RM Lodha panel clarifies that it has not directed banks to freeze the board's accounts. Our top story, the RBI Monetary Policy Panel slashed interest rates by 25 basis points on Tuesday. Softening inflation seems to have prodded the RBI to lower the repo rate to a six-year low at 6.25%. It also exuded confidence on meeting the inflation target of 2 to 6 percent in the current financial year. Some festival cheer is in the offing with the RBI signaling a possible cut in your housing and car loans. In his maiden announcement, RBI Governor Urjit Patel slashed repo rate by 25 basis points to 6.25 percent from 6.5 percent. All six members of the newly constituted monetary policy panel voted in favour of the rate cut. The reverse repo rate also came down to 5.75%. In RBI's fourth bi-monthly policy meet, Patel voiced concern over the swelling NPAs of the banks, while underscoring the need for a determined effort to remedy it. Patel also affirmed that only five sectors contribute 61% of stressed assets of the banking sector. Our discussions were frank often intense, but always friendly. We allowed each other to speak, and we ensured that there is no rancor, and that at the end of the day, we agreed on an MPC resolution that we have placed before the country. The RBI also asked banks to pass the benefit of falling interest rates to consumers. The latest repo rate cut has caused a cumulative 175 basis points drop since January 2015, but banks have cut loan rates by only 70 to 80 basis points. They have reduced the rates much lesser than 1.25%. The average which has been indicated in that report is about 0.5%. During the RBI's decision, the Sensex rose to 91.26 points to close at 28,334, while Nifty gained 31.05 points to close at 8,769. The RBI has pegged gross value added growth of 7.6% for the current fiscal and 7.9% for the next year. It, however, has warned of risks on growth due to muted private investment, weak global demand and geopolitical risks. Reporting from Delhi, with camera person Manish Bhalla, I'm Kriti Mishra for Rajya Sabha Television. In other news, Singapore Prime Minister Lee Hsien Long met uh, P Prime Minister Narendra Modi in New Delhi on Tuesday. Both leaders held comprehensive talks on a number of issues, including ways to enhance cooperation in trade and investment. They also agreed to strengthen cooperation in countering terrorism. Prime Minister Narendra Modi held summit-level talks with his Singaporean counterpart Lee Hsien Loong on Tuesday. India and Singapore signed three MOUs aimed at utilizing the technical and managerial potential of Singapore. Two of the pacts are aimed at collaborating on technical and vocational education, while the third one deals with intellectual property rights to facilitate greater business-to-business -business exchanges and collaborations. Prime Minister Lee and I also welcome the issuance of corporate rupee bonds in Singapore. It is a step forward in our effort to mobilize capital for India's large infrastructure development needs. We discuss how India and Singapore can deepen our financial cooperation and we agreed to appoint senior ministers on both sides. In, my, in Singapore's case, DPM Taman Shamalukaratnam and in India's case, Finance Minister Arun Jaitley to discuss how we can 
come up with new and innovative ways to cooperate. The Prime Ministers of both countries agreed that defence and security cooperation is a key pillar of strategic partnership between India and Singapore. And that's why, as maritime nations, both sides agreed to keep the sea lanes of communication open. As two maritime nations, keeping the sea lanes of communication open and respect for international legal order of seas and oceans is a shared priority. Our cooperation in the framework of ASEAN East Asia Summit and the ASEAN Regional Framework is aimed at building an open and inclusive architecture for regional cooperation in an atmosphere of trust and confidence. The issue of terrorism, particularly cross-border terrorism, figured prominently in the talks. Rising tide of terrorism, especially cross-border terrorism and the rise of radicalization are grave challenges to our security. They threaten the very fabric of our societies. It is my firm belief that those who believe in peace and humanity need to stand and act together against this menace. I express my condolences to the Indian government and the families of the victims of the Uri attack. Singapore strongly condemns terrorist attacks of all forms. The Singaporean Prime Minister is on a five-day visit to India, during which he will also visit Rajasthan on the 5th and 6th of October. Singapore is significant for India. Prime Minister Narendra Modi himself has visited twice in the last two years to Singapore. It will be interesting to see that how geographically smaller Singapore can synergize with geographically big India. Akhilesh Soman for Rajasthan Television with camera person Junaid in Delhi. And Sri Lankan Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe also arrived on Tuesday on a three-day visit to India. During his stay, the Lankan Prime Minister is scheduled to hold talks with the top leadership, including Prime Minister Narendra Modi. He will also hold meetings with External Affairs Minister Sushma Swaraj, Transport Minister Nitin Gadkari, and Minister of State for Petroleum and Natural Gas Dharmendra Pradhan. On Wednesday, the Lankan Prime Minister is expected to call on President Pranam Mukherjee. On Thursday, he will attend the opening plenary of the India Economic Summit before returning to Colombo. The visit by the Sri Lankan Prime Minister assumes significance as it comes just days after India, along with several other countries, pulled out of the SARC summit scheduled to be held in Islamabad next month. Sri Lanka had supported India in its decision, saying that the environment was not conducive for the summit to take place. Now the latest on Jammu and Kashmir and suspected terrorists attacked a police station in Kulgam district once again. As the news is still coming in, details, in fact, of the attack remain sketchy and as of now there have been no casualties is what we are learning. The attack comes at a time of continuous tension between India and Pakistan along the line of control. The Pakistani army has been violating the 2003 ceasefire agreement by resorting to unprovoked heavy firing targeting Indian posts. The Indian army has retaliated with mortar shells and small arms fire. In the last 24 hours, Pakistan has violated the ceasefire at least six times. And as it continues to violate the ceasefire along the line of control, indulging in cross-border firing, in fact, five times on Tuesday. And as the situation on the border remains tense, Home Minister Rajnath Singh visited the Kargil War Memorial in Dras sector. As Home Minister Rajnath Singh paid tributes to martyrs at the Kargil War Memorial in Jammu and Kashmir, Pakistani troops continued to violate the ceasefire along the line of control. Ceasefire has been violated at least five times by Pakistan over the last four hours in Naushera sector. The ceasefire violation has taken place in Naushera sector and at three places. It started at five in the morning and at two locations it has stopped and at one location it is still continuing. No, there are no reports of any casualty as of now and we are responding appropriately and giving a very befitting reply to the Pakistani unprovoked ceasefire violation. Pakistani troops have been firing mortar bombs, automatic weapons and small arms along the LOC, forcing villagers to live on the edge under constant fear, take refuge in the bushes or hide inside their homes. बहुत फायरिंग हो रही है रात से सुबह 24 घंटे से फायरिंग हो रही है पाकिस्तान वाले लोग हैं ना जो उन्होंने पांच बार इधर गोलाबारी की है सभी डरे हुए अंदर छुपे हुए हैं बच्चे भी रो रहे हैं तो बहुत परेशानी हो रही है हमारा जो अभी तक एग्रीकल्चर का सीजन चल रहा है कल्टीवेशन चल रही है मक्की और हमारी खेती की 
तो उस कारण लोग ज़्यादा ज़्यादा बहुत ज़्यादा डिस्टर्ब हैं और छुपे हुए हैं सुबह से कहीं ना कहीं कोई अभी बैंकर की भी फैसिलिटी तो है नहीं है ना ही कोई सही ढंग से बैंकर है और अभी जो माइग्रेशन की प्लानिंग है वो भी अभी अधूरी है However, state authorities claim to have given adequate help and bunkers to villagers for hiding. LC forward area में firing चल रही है और उसमें हमने हमने तो पूरी तैयारियां कर ली हुई हैं। अगर civilian area में थोड़ी सी भी आती है तो हम एहतियातन के तौर पे हम अपने border villages पे जितने भी हमारे villages हैं, वहाँ से हम लोगों को वहाँ से plan करवा देंगे और safe areas में हमने रिहाशी camps बना के रखे हुए हैं और उसमें हमने पूरी व्यवस्था करके � this at a time when the Home Minister's visit to Dras is supposed to bring back a sense of peace and stability to the valley. Singh reviewed the security situation in the state with state government officials in tow briefing him on the prevailing law and order situation. Political parties ke delegations mile, wahi par different social, cultural, traders, religious organizations ke log bhi yahan par mile hain aur logon ne इस कारगिल के डेवलपमेंट को लेकर चिंता व्यक्त की है और उसका पूरी तरह से काग्निजन हम लोगों ने लिया है और जाकर संबंधित जिन मंत्रालयों से संबंधित काम है उन मंत्रालयों को हम रिफर करेंगे आवश्यकता पड़ी तो संबंधित मंत्री से भी बात करेंगे The Home Minister also rubbished demands of proof of last week's surgical strikes carried out by the Indian Army. किन दिलाना चाहता हूँ देशवासियों को कि इस देश के मान सम्मान पर आंच नहीं आने देंगे और देश का मस्तक किसी भी सूरत में झुकने नहीं देंगे। Meanwhile, the body of BSF जवान नितिन कुमार, who lost his life during Monday's terror attack on his camp in Baramulla, was brought to his hometown Itawa for his last rites. As his family mourned the death, villagers gathered in large numbers to pay their last tributes to Kumar. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Meanwhile, the border security force on Tuesday disclosed that Pakistan has intensified snooping on Indian armed forces along the international border. BSF Director General KK Sharma affirmed that unmanned aerial vehicle movement has been spotted very close to the Indo-Pak border in the recent past. Amid increasing tensions in the wake of the surgical strikes by India, the border security force is stepping up security on the western border. But BSF Director General KK Sharma confirmed they haven't ordered evacuation of villagers living along the international border. Those who went and went, they were also aware of where I know they are coming back. So the international boundary is necessary to be tensioned, but there is no need for any opportunity or any exchange of fire. The DGBSF also denied reports of any friendly fire resulting in casualties in the terror attack on the Baramulla camp. सजगता बढ़ाई गई है इसमें कोई शक नहीं। The Director General Level Biannual Border Dialogue between India and Bangladesh also concluded on Tuesday. In order to check infiltration, the border force also reviewed preparedness of the security mechanism along the Eastern Front. दोनों forces पूरी तरह से मुस्तैद हैं, तैनात हैं और किसी भी तरह की उस कोशिश को कि militants को Bangladesh के रास्ते infiltrate कराया जाए, उसको कामयाब नहीं होने दिया जाएगा इसकी हम आपको अश्वरस देते हैं। We can say both BGB and BSF we are having sincere efforts and say intention to prevent any such kind of infiltration. The BSF also confirmed a stone pelting incident near the Vaga border during the beating retreat ceremony held on 2nd October. Kriti Mishra's report for Rajya Sabha TV. With a quick break here, we'll be back with more news in a bit. Stay with us. Harappan sites are a treasure trove of sophisticated pottery. These creations show tremendous advances by the potter's wheel. Creations like the perforated jar, the copper axe, the chisel and knives astound even present-day archaeologists. Figurines depicting yoga poses, chess pieces display a complexity unsurpassed even by later day civilizations, all of which make the Harappan civilization truly unique.
Welcome back. Let's get to some more national news then. One story that we've been tracking, of course, for weeks. The Supreme Court on Tuesday ordered Karnataka to release 2,000 cusics of water to Tamil Nadu now. The court has ordered the release for water daily from the 7th to the 18th of October. Meanwhile, AIADMK MP submitted a memorandum to Prime Minister Narendra Modi appealing him to intervene in the Kaveri issue. A day after Karnataka government released around 9,000 cusics of water for irrigation to Tamil Nadu, the Supreme Court on Tuesday ordered it once again to release 2,000 cusics of water per day to the state from 7th to 18th October. The court also said the chairman of Central Water Committee will lead a team to survey ground realities and submit a report by 18th October, the next date of hearing. अभी आगे ये डायरेक्शन दिया है कि टेक्निकल कमेटी जाएगी जो सुपरवाइजरी कमेटी का एक भाग है एक तरीके का भाग है और वो ग्राउंड रियलिटी देखकर कोर्ट को रिपोर्ट करेगी और फाइनल सुनवाई जो है 18 अक्टूबर के लिए तय हो गई उसके बाद थ्री जज बेंच ये सारे विषयों को सुनेगा और डिसाइड करेगा कि किसकी दायित्व है किसकी ड्यूटी है even as the top court pulled up the Karnataka government for its defiance, the state assembly passed a resolution that the state will release water to farmers in the Kaveri Basin. Meanwhile, a delegation of AIA DMK MPs met Prime Minister Narendra Modi in Delhi to seek his intervention on the issue. They also asked the centre to withdraw its application in the Supreme Court, seeking modification of order on constituting the Kaveri Board. We people, on behalf of our MPs, went to Prime Minister's office, handed over the memorandum, see that uh, the Kaveri management will be constituted quickly. We requested the Prime Minister to intervene in the issue and see that uh, Kaveri management will be constituted immediately as per the direction of the Supreme Court. On September 30th, the Supreme Court asked the Centre to set up the board by October 4th. Its members were to travel to both Tamil Nadu and Karnataka to assess their needs. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Vice President Mohammad Hamid Ansari has warned of a water crisis in the country due to the growing population. Speaking at a centenary celebration of the Central Water and Power Research Station in Pune on Tuesday, the Vice President said that the increasing population has placed unreasonable demands on natural resources, including water. He cited the Yamuna River as an example of stressed water resources, calling on policymakers to prioritize water conservation. The Vice President said that the entire problem lies in inequitable water distribution, non-utilization and ill-planned utilization of water resources. The of stream results in flood causing widespread loss of life and property. India's proverbial poverty amongst plenty is, to a large extent, related to results from the hydrometeorological conditions, inequitable spatial distribution, non-utilization and ill-planned utilization of water resources. And here's a look at more national news updates in Nationwide. Three passengers were injured as 10 coaches of the Jamutawi Pune Jhelum Express derailed near Satluj River in Jalandhar district early today. The injured were taken to the civil hospital in Ludhiana. The accident took place around 3 a.m. between Pilor and Ladhowal stations. The Haji Ali Dargah Trust on Monday approached the Supreme Court to challenge the Bombay High Court verdict that recently allowed the entry of women into the inner sanctum sanctorum of the renowned Muslim shrine. Early on the 26th of August, the Bombay High Court had also asked the state to ensure safety and security for the women entering the inner sanctum. The Spectrum auction entered 15th round on day 3 with the bidding hitting 100% activity level, but there's still no demand for the premium 700 and 900 megahertz bands. Sources say bidding interest continues to be largely around the 1800 MHz and 2300 MHz that can be used by operators to provide 4G services. As Maharashtra's former Deputy Chief Minister and Senior Nationalist Congress Party leader Chagan Bhujbal marked almost seven months in custody, around 20 lakh supporters from all over India took to the streets on Nasik on Monday seeking his release. Bhujwal was arrested in March this year in connection with several cases pertaining to alleged corruption, money laundering and land deals and has remained in custody since.
Now, with the BCCI threatening to call off the ongoing series between India and New Zealand, the Justice Aram Lodha panel today clarified that it did not direct the banks to freeze accounts of the cricket board. The panel said that they had directed the BCCI, though, to not disperse funds to state associations. The BCCI, in turn, says that state associations depend on the board for organising matches that were prepared and the preparations, in fact, were being affected. The tussle between India's cricket governing body, BCCI, and the Supreme Court-appointed Lodha Committee has intensified, with the BCCI threatening to call off the ongoing series between India and New Zealand. The threat came following the Lodha panel directing the banks holding BCCI accounts to not disperse large funds to state associations. However, the Justice RM Lodha-led panel clarified that they did not direct the banks to freeze the accounts and that the board can carry on with its routine expenses. There is no question of cancellation of any game or series. Uh, the directive which we issued to BCCI yesterday uh, in our email is confined to disbursement of large funds to the state associations and banks have been directed to ensure compliance of that. Nothing beyond that. Uh, routine expenses for matches, games, um, uh, cricketing activities and other administrative matters, um, uh, they are not at all uh, restrained. There is absolutely no prohibition, there is no constraint, the accounts of BCCI have not been frozen. An upset BCCI however retorted that the board's reputation was ruined by the freezing of its bank accounts and raised a question mark on whether it was able enough to run cricket activities in the country. BCCI also argued that state associations were dependent on the parent body for organising matches and were unable to carry on their functioning in the wake of the latest directive from the Lotha panel. I would like to inform the committee members, it is not the BCCI who hosts the matches, it is the state associations who organises the matches for the Indian cricket. If they are not being paid, can they host matches in India? And why this money is being stopped? This money belongs to the state associations. If they are not being paid, how can they run cricket? The BCCI has a long-running battle with the Supreme Court appointed panel, which has recommended sweeping changes to bring more transparency and accountability to the board's functioning. However, despite constant warnings by the panel, the BCCI has ignored several important recommendations. Last week, the Apex Court warned the board to fall in line or face the consequences. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. And here are more sports updates in Sports Beat. The Court of Arbitration for Sport has reduced Russian tennis star Maria, Maria Sharapova's ban to 15 months following her appeal against a two year doping ban. Sharapova will be able to return to tennis court in April 2017. The five-time Grand Slam winner was banned by the International Tennis Federation in June this year following a positive test for a banned drug during the Australian Open. The Russian had said that she had been taking the drug since 2006 for health problems. Rafael Nadal eased into the second round of the China Open with a 6-1, 6-1 victory over Italy's Paolo Lorenzi. Second-seeded Nadal will face uh, either compatriot Albert Ramos Vinolas or French qualifier Adrian Manorino. British top-seeded uh, player Andy Murray also advanced to the second round with a 6-2, 7-5 win over Andrea Seppi. FIFA President Gianni Infantino has proposed expanding the World Cup finals to 48 teams. Infantino suggested that 16 of those teams would be eliminated after just one knockout match and the remainder of the tournament would be played in the current format with a 32-team group stage followed by a knockout phase. Now, the 2016 Nobel Prize for Physics has been awarded to three British-born scientists for their discoveries about strange forms of matter using topology. David Thielis, Duncan Haldane and Michael Kosterlitz will share 8 million Swedish krona or about $930,000 prize money. One half of the prize was awarded to Thielis while Haldane and Kosterlitz will share the other half. The work would result in improved materials for electronics and is already informing one approach to superfast computing. The award was announced by the Royal Academy of Science in Stockholm in Sweden. 
The Nobel Committee said that the discoveries of the three scientists had opened the door on an unknown world. In more international news, the U.S. is suspending talks with Russia over Syria, accusing Moscow of having failed to live up to its commitments under the ceasefire deal. Washington blamed Russia for the Syrian government for intensifying their attacks against civilians. The U.S. had warned last week of halting the talks unless Moscow stops bombing the city of Aleppo. Meanwhile, Russia said that it regretted the U.S.'s move, accusing it of shifting the blame for the collapse of last month's truce. Aleppo has come under heavy aerial bombardment since the end of the ceasefire two weeks ago. The failure of the U.S.-Russian talks on Syria suggests that there is little hope of a diplomatic solution emerging any time soon to end the five-and-a-half-year-old civil war that has killed hundreds of thousands and displaced 11 million people. Well, I think what is clear is the Obama administration has concluded that Russia has no intention of living up to the commitments that they've made in the context of negotiations around a cessation of hostilities. And once you've reached that conclusion, I'm not really sure what else there is to talk about. And again, I'm not papering over the, the, uh, uh, the tragic consequences that this is going to have for Syria. This was our, um, this was a reasonable, thought-through strategy for applying pressure to the Assad regime in pursuit of the aims that we were seeking to uh, achieve. Uh, we're going to have to pursue an alternative approach. And here are more international news updates in Global Buzz. 6,000 migrants were rescued while 22 were found dead on the sea route to Europe on Monday. About 10 ships from the Coast Guard, the Navy and humanitarian organizations were involved in the rescue, most of which took place off the coast of Libya. Around 130, uh, 132,000 migrants have reportedly arrived in Italy since the start of the year and 3,054 have died. Cuba is taking preventive measures to minimize the negative effects of approaching powerful Hurricane Matthew. The government has evacuated more than 200,000 people from coastal communities so far. The hurricane is approaching the southern part of Cuba's eastern provinces as the weather continues to deteriorate. Cuban President Raul Castro is also arranging for military units to prepare for search and rescue missions in case of natural disasters. Former Portuguese Prime Minister Antonio Guterres is in the lead to become the next United Nations Secretary General after a fourth UN Security Council ballot earlier this month. The 15-member Security Council will continue holding secret ballots in a bid to reach consensus on a candidate than, uh, that it then recommends to the 193-member UN General Assembly for election. The next secret ballot is scheduled for Wednesday. South Korea's ban is scheduled to step down at the end of 2016 after serving two five-year terms. Egypt's interior ministry said that it killed a senior Muslim Brotherhood leader who was responsible for the group's armed wing, along with another member of the group in a shootout on Monday. Mohammed Kamal and Yasser Sehata were reportedly killed when an apartment in Cairo's Ben, ben Sathin neighborhood was raided after learning that it was used by the leaders as a headquarter. That's all we have for you in your news tonight. Thanks so much for joining us.